Hi all, good morning. I have a new paper to sample. It's called Hanimule. Hanimule. <laughs> I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's a German company. Cold press paper, 9 by 12, with this great little cover sheet. And it has a really cool texture, kind of between, if you're thinking about arches paper, kind of between the cold press and the rough press. So it's a cold press paper, but slightly rough texture, if that makes any sense at all. <laughs> I start off by t using scotch tape to tape my border and I also leave a little area down at the bottom where I'll have my color trail where I will swatch out the colors I used on my painting. For the month of November, I've started this series where I'm including the online community with my weekly workshops. So if you can't be there in person, you can still paint along with me here on YouTube. In the description box will be all of my art supplies and written instructions so whether you're a visual an audible or a or your learning style is by reading there's three sources here <laughs> not to mention you can ask your questions in the comments box and i'll get back to you as soon as i can using an f pencil i'm going to try and draw in the same style of painting which is all at once or a la prima so we'll be painting a single pink rose today with a little bit of foliage in the background. So to draw all at once, it's kind of like contour drawing where sketch I try it out to without lifting my pencil up off the paper as much as possible. If I do lift it, it's just a little itty bitty bit. And this way I kind of get a flow and I'm concentrating on the shapes and the silhouette, not every last detail. In the weeks to come, I do hope to have a lesson where we focus on the foliage and leaves and adding details, but for today, we're going to be doing a semi-abstract rose, focusing on shapes, light and dark values, and just getting a color harmony or kind of capturing that vibe, that atmosphere, that mood, that emotion that I'm feeling at this moment. This week I had, had a lot on my mind, and so I stole away, I only had like 15 minutes to paint, and so I stole away that time to do this first layer um, for this rose, which will be painted all at once, and just adding the colors in intuitively, so somewhat inspired by the image, the pink and the blue-green leaves, but also I'll be adding other colors that I feel complement or work well with these colors. I'll be using my six color palette that um, I've used in the past two videos. I put a little dollop on the edge of my ramekins and let it dry. And then I add a little water to the ramekins and I can mix as I go, I can gently use the corner of my angle shader brush to pull color down for my mixes. I really like this style of using the ramekins for my mixing because a lot in the same way I'm able to draw all at once for this painting and paint all at once, it allows me to mix all at once as well. I can literally you know, begin to mix a pink and then I can pull down a little yellow or a little bit of magenta as I go, just shifting that color ever so slightly. And anyways, I wonder, have any of you tried it? And if so, leave me a comment and tell me what you think. I really like it. It's becoming my go-to way to mix color. So here I'm adding a little bit of yellow to that pink mix. And then adding this little bit of yellow will just shift that pink. Maybe it will dry a little peachier or a little oranger. I can also shift how thick my paint is by painting and mixing my color in the ramekin because if I take my paintbrush and, and put it on the dry dollop of paint, I'll be getting a thicker mix, less water, or I can add water into the ramekin to get a more tea-like consistency. So kind of cool. Already I'm seeing some lovely blends of those yellows and pinks mixing together. I also added some pink down on the leaves and I think that that is gonna be really pretty to have that um, 
the color of the rose echoing down into the foliage. For my foliage color, I'm using some Thalo Turquoise and Thalo Blue Red Shade with a little bit of Quinacridone Sienna. This is a great color mix for your foliage because you can go more to olive sap green by adding more sienna and go back to a bluer green by adding more turquoise. So you can shift that green, you know, to so many different shades. So now using my angle shader brush, I'm going to be adding some green and kind of circling around those little pink bits that I added those little echoes of the flower down into the leaves. Right now that color mix reminds me of this plant my grandmother used to have growing on her front porch in the shade. It had that pink in the leaves. It grew kind of like a weed in. It was a, a planter um, in a planter and I can't think of the name of it right now. But it, she always had it, always had this. So anyways, it's always funny how when we're painting, different colors can make us think of different things. Some of us are very connected to color, and it can take us back to a place. Uh, for instance, in last week's class, one of the attending artists had done two versions of our painting. One had bold, saturated color, and one had a more muted color palette. As a class, we couldn't decide which we liked more because both were executed very well, very beautiful paintings. But something that really touched my heart was one of the other artists, upon observing the more muted version of the painting, immediately thought of her mother's bedroom and how that painting would have fit perfectly in her mother's bedroom and that her mother would have loved it. And the warmth that... I saw across her face was so touching and such a good reminder that don't feel that you always have to paint exact color, you know, and, and match every color to your photograph or your surroundings. You can emote your emotions, your feelings, your memories um, into your paintings by choosing different colors. I would have never known as I painted this that I would be reminded of my grandmother's porch. And much like the other artists thinking of her mother's room, it's just a really beautiful thing that we can experience with watercolor. Here I mixed a little bit of the magenta into my Thalo turquoise and made a fabulous purple, <laughs> which I'm gonna use to add a little bit of dark in a couple of places just breaking up some of these colors. And uh, right now I have just about completed my color trail, deciding which colors to include. So I'm gonna warm up with some Quinacridone Sienna and Quinacridone Magenta to create kind of a dusty, <clears throat> maybe a dusty mauve violet. <laughs> I don't know, what would you call this color? I love it, I'm adding it to the color trail and I'm gonna use this in my background very subtly, meaning that I will apply it in a couple of places and then I'll use water to connect it to the leaves, just kissing the other areas of the painting that are still wet and allowing that to blend out onto the paper. Now, one of the questions I get asked is how does this work? How do you do this to where it does blend out and create a lot of lost and founds, but also you can still see some of the shapes and that's because the colors I'm using are staining. So they've had a moment to sit on the paper and stain it a little bit. So some of these leaves will completely blend out into the background because they were fresher and some of the ones that have been there longer might leave more of an impression. I like to hold my painting on a diagonal and let all that excess water run across and just break up my image a little bit more. So I have the symbol of a flower and the symbol of the foliage. A few shapes are very defined. A few shapes are diffusing into the background and kind of getting lost it's satisfying watching the water and the colors blend on the paper. It's, 
it's it for me. This is what I love about watercolor. And so I've set it up on an incline so it could dry. And I've waited until my next 15 minutes I'm able to still away. And so a day has passed and I'm gonna go and think about finishing touches now. It was really hard to decide what I wanted to do with this because I was so pleased with it right here. I feel that the day in question when I was painting, I captured my mood and the emotions and anyways, I'm happy with this right here, right now. But for all of you, I think it would be really fun to share some ideas I have on finishing touches. So I'm taking some blank cards that are plastic. You can get a whole box of them on um, Amazon. And I'm gonna take scissors and I'm going to cut out some shapes. Now these shapes that I'm cutting, you could do this on any kind of plastic. I've also shared this same technique but using tape so you can take a piece of scotch tape and shape out um, little like basically you're cutting the outer part of each petal or the outer part of each leaf and then that way see how it lines up and then you can gently lift it with a wet toothbrush and bring back some of the light value but anyway so i'm cutting the shapes that i want to lift out of my flower so I wanted to define my petals a little bit more than they are right now by lifting some light values. So now that I have my shapes cut, I'm going to take a, a wet toothbrush <laughs> and give it a little scrub and then dab it with my tissue. And I'm gonna keep repeating this until I've lifted out some highlights on my roses as well as lifting out and defining a few of my leaves because my lost and found there was more lost than found <laughs> last week we talked a little bit about finding your middle which what i mean by that is think about goldilocks and she finds the one bed to be too hard the other bed to be too soft and then the one bed being just right and so that is what I like to think about when I'm talking about abstract. So you have your photorealism, your semi-realism, realism, you know, your semi-abstract, your abstract, right? There's so many levels there. And so where is yours? Like where, how much realism do you need to where you're satisfied with your painting? This is a personal choice. There isn't a right or wrong answer. It's just a matter of finding that place. And for me, it was around 2020 when I, my father and grandfather passed away that I really let go of perfect, chasing perfect, chasing perfect. No matter where you're chasing perfect, it could be fitness or finances or relationships or just doing the laundry, <laughs> right? I mean, there's so many levels of chasing perfect and I was chasing perfect with my art. I wanted mastery. I was just so frustrated and, and emotional about my art instead of just letting go, letting God and enjoying the journey and finding my way and sadly losing my loved ones really pushed me to a place of breaking down and my art broke down with it. And so it's really hard to answer questions about why do you paint it this way or why do you do it that way? And I would just say that this is how I do it. Not a right way, not a wrong way, and definitely not a do it my way or the highway. I'm not here to teach you any you know, strict way of, of this or that. I'm here just to show you where I'm at, what I'm doing, <laughs> the cool color blends I've learned or a new technique or just sharing um, art with all of you. And I would love to hear, how do you find your middle? How do you find, how do you break free of Goldilocks syndrome? And how do you find your place in art? Where do you um, enjoy it the most? Some people will say, well, I don't have a style. I don't, I don't even know what I want. Well, then I would say, go back to that painting you really loved, the one where you enjoyed the process or 
you were just, for whatever reason, it came easier to you or you felt kind of that flow or that vibe I talk about a lot, start there. As I'm going along, I'm going to cut out some more shapes that will mimic my leaves and also lift out some leaf um, highlights as well. Another way to help find your middle or connect to your to your artistic vision, finding out, well, this is what I'd like my art to say or do or look like or feel like is to seek out artists who are, when you look at their work, you feel like that's in line with where you want to be with yours. And you can, you know, Google that artist and see, are they having any in-person workshops in your area? Do they offer Zoom or online courses? Do they, have they, um, published any books? Do they have any DVDs or uh, online downloads for sale? Uh, A lot of times their websites are really underrated source. It seems like everybody just relies on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram to follow their favorites and they miss out on logging into that person's website because oftentimes you'll find things out about that artist you didn't even know you know, you, you might find that they have a blog where you, they have, might have written articles or they might have been in international shows or, um, for instance, we have an international show right here in Fallbrook, California once a year. It's a watercolor signature show. So artists from all over the world who have received signature status with a watercolor society are allowed to enter. Now to get signature status with the Watercolor Society, you have to be accepted into three of their annual international shows. And once you've gotten three acceptances, you can then sign your name with the initials of that Watercolor Society. So this show in Fallbrook, California is huge because only signature artists are allowed to show. So you could literally go and find some of your famous artists from all over the world hanging on the walls. They ship their paintings there. They chose the mat, the frame, (laughs) and they chose which painting to enter. So, you know, like I said, you can learn a lot by their websites. And I got to tell you, it's, it's exhilarating when you go to one of these shows and you see some of your favorites hanging on the wall and you get to look at it up close because I will say that about watercolor. Seeing their work online or on YouTube is nothing compared to seeing them in person because when you see these paintings in person, you can really see the texture of the paper, the brush strokes. You can see if they used any granulating colors. You can see if they used any iridescence. So maybe they have a little sparkle or shine. Sometimes you can see imperfections. So be sure to not only search out your favorite artists to see what they have available, but also search out your community and see what it has available. Sometimes you could put in watercolor association near me, watercolor society near me, watercolor paint outs near me, or watercolor, you know, plain air events around me. And you might find that you have some local things you didn't even realize. (laughs) Okay, back to painting. I'm adding some darker value, some magenta into my flower around the areas that I lifted. So I lifted my highlights and now I'm adding my low lights. <laughs> and I'm also going to mix up a nice color for the background to deepen that as well and do some negative painting around my shapes to bring um, a little bit of what was lost, um, bring them to found. So I might not have explained what lost and found is. Well, a lot of times lost and found edges are where, you know, you have some edges that are clearly defined and others that seem to almost disappear into your background. Or you might have a pink petal that just merges into a leaf. Um, So it's just a really neat way of painting it adds a bit of a ethereal feel to it. So I, as you can see, all those pretty leaves I painted earlier are kind of 
you know, faded. So by negative painting around it, I'll be able to bring some shapes back up. You know, another tip I would give on finding your place in art would be to study some of the greats. You know, you can go to thriftbooks.com or Abe Books and find used good quality art books for just dollars. It's amazing some of the deals I have found. I've built a collection of Tony Couch, Edgar Whitney, Elliot O'Hara, just to name a few. And this library, these books are priceless. They're as good and relatable and to the point <laughs> now as they were at the time they were written. They really bring another another layer to your understanding of watercolor by not only following artists that are trending now or popular or um, in in with the times, <laughs> but also studying artists who, um, you know, some of the artist books, some of the art books that I have, the artists are no longer with us. They've passed on. And so it's such an honor to read their thoughts on art and their techniques and their color mixes and, and learn about them. And, and in a way, their art lives on. By now, if you've been watching my channel, you'll know my core value is that art is better shared. And so I think that studying some of the greats from you know times past is a great way of honoring that and continuing to share that. So do you have an artist that... Uh, you recommend I would love for you to leave their name down in the comment section uh, so we can all look them up and check them out so here I begin doing my negative painting which is painting the area basically behind and around the subject and that way it just helps to define those shapes so much like the past two videos I'll use I'll add a line of color and then I'll use my angle shader brush to blend it out. So oftentimes I'll use my round brush to add the line of color and then my angle shader brush to do the blending. Remember what we talked about with lost and found. You don't have to outline every last leaf and every last shape. You can outline parts of it. You can choose um, shapes to connect. So you can use your dark value to decide on a pathway for the eye to travel. So when the viewer comes and looks at your artwork, this dark value, these areas of high contrast, often are where the eye goes. So thinking of that, choosing where to put these darks in order to take your viewer up through the beautiful foliage into the flower, which is the focal point. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit so you can see this done up close. So see how I've used my round brush and then my angle shader brush. Just doing that push and pull method that you've seen in my other videos. This is another one of my favorite watercolor techniques, the negative painting. I love it. I think it's such a neat workaround and such a nice way to have um, a little bit less detail and rely more on the shapes and silhouettes. More and more, as the more I paint, the more that when I'm out and about and I'm looking at something, I'll begin to study the shape and the way that light and shadow plays on things. I think that has to do a lot with our progression as artists is how we see things. And so when you are, for instance, if you paint flowers, when you're around flowers, observing them and seeing how the leaves connect to the branch, um, are their edges smooth? Do they have little spikes? For instance, rose foliage has the little, you know, pointy, sharp edges around the leaves. There's thorns on the stem. So, you know, there's these little things that you can add. But for this painting, 
I, I didn't worry too much about all that. I was more worried about balancing my color and my values. So here I'm just choosing how far I want my background to stretch out across the paper. I don't want it to be half and half where half the page is painted and half the page isn't. I wanted a little bit of a blend out or a little bit more of a blend out towards the right. So that's what I'm doing here. Just doing a bit at a time. The idea of doing this all a prima or all at once was basically to just try and do each session in one sitting. So my first layer, that very abstract lost and found, was done one day and then I had to go. I didn't have time to do another layer, so I let it dry. And then the next opportunity I got where I could sit in one sitting to finish was this session that you're watching right now. And so I can take my time as long as I have time to finish. And that way we can have the same balanced, you know, centered frame of mind for that whole painting. I used to spend 30 minutes a day on a painting and it would take weeks sometimes to finish. So each day I would flip an hourglass over and spend about 30 minutes on it and then the next day and then the next day. And it was a little bit of a challenge to always find that same pace. You know, even when we're talking, have you ever noticed sometimes you get really excited or nervous or anxious and you talk really, really fast? Or maybe you talk at a higher tone versus other times where you're feeling pretty mellow and you talk at a slower pace. Well, I think we have a pace for painting as well. So the goal of Alla Prima is to have a steady pace for that, that session of painting. When you're in an in-person class, <laughs> it's not always, um, it doesn't always work out that way. And like, for instance, my last week's painting, I thought my the one that I did the video here on YouTube, I loved it, but the one I did in class, oof, it was, it was heavy handed and I just, I didn't have a very good pace during that class. So I'm hoping that on Wednesday when I do this painting, I'll have more success, but I'm going to try and make a point that if I feel that I'm losing my pace to stand up and walk away for a minute or step outside for a second and get a, you know, breath of fresh air um, and just try and be more cognitive of um, am I feeling rushed? Am I feeling calm? And that way I can emote a peaceful painting. Every time you deepen the value in one area of your painting, you may find you need to deepen it in another area. <laughs> so um, try not to overwork your painting though. It can get to that point though where you've done too much. For instance, if I do too dark on my center, then I might need to darken all the green again or all the foliage again, and I don't wanna do that, so. Remember, we're trying to add just enough detail to tell the story. So my background blue color was a mixture of the thalo blue red shade with a little bit of the magenta and sienna in it, and that makes a really cool deep denim gray blue color. I don't know if you noticed or not, but by adding that little bit of blue, it not only achieved a value change to do the negative painting to bring the foliage forward, but it also framed the flower somewhat by leaving the upper right hand corner off white or nearly white and then having it transition into the blue for the other three quarters of the paper in a way sends the viewer back to the focal point. The color is interesting. The overall color palette of this painting, it reminds me, like if I were to name it, I might name it, you know, Winter Rose. <laughs> um, it's got, a, a definitely got a wintry, rainy day vibe going. I've decided since I increased the value on the flower, I want to increase some value in the foliage as well. And so I've chosen to use 
the color of the rose and bring that color back into the story. I really loved how it looked at the beginning on that first layer that I did that reminded me of grandma's plant. I actually found the name of it. It was a caladium and I believe it was the flamingo version and it definitely had this pink encased with like a blue green on the leaf. So pretty cool. Maybe one day I'll find it at the nursery and can have a pot growing on my shady porch too. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? So anyways, I may have forgot to mention earlier in this video, but at the very beginning of the video, I have the reference photo. So that way you can pause the video and you can take a photograph and then print it out to be um, for your own use. Another thing is that, remember how I was talking about finding your pace? By watching this tutorial online, don't forget you can pause it at any time, take a break from it, come back to it. There is a feature where you can save your video to view later. Or if you've lost the video, you can just always go to at watercolor pour to see my whole video library. Sometimes I like to look at my older videos to see how I've progressed. <laughs> Anyways, um, so these finally, these final touches, you know, I talk about my push and pull method of using the round brush with the angle shader brush to blend it out. I also tend to call this a push and pull. So I'm pushing in value and pulling out highlights. So pushing in by adding color changes, saturation changes, value changes, and pulling out by lifting. I do a lot of lifting as you saw on this video, but you can also push in some highlights by using a chalk or a pastel pencil. And you can just very softly add these into areas where you want to add a little texture, a little softness. It has a matte finish. This paper has like a rough texture. It has a cool texture, definitely. So I wanted to use the chalk pencil to just really, you know, skip across that texture and let it really be seen kind of showcase it and this is the one of the best parts of the painting I, I love the really loose part where I'm either pouring or I'm painting a la prima but I also love this step which is just finding that balance and making sure there's echoes is there echoes of color across the page is there echoes of value are there echoes of highlights and oftentimes once i find that balance that's when i know my painting is done and i'll go ahead and give it a signing when i started this painting i had a lot on my mind and so i was a little concerned that my painting would be too heavy-handed um, overworked but i i love that instead this painting served as a little bit of art therapy and gave me a little bit of reprieve from my thoughts and circumstances and allowed me to just, you know, listen to my music, you know, have a conversation with God, <laughs> talk things out in my head, work things out, or sometimes it's just the process itself. Huh, maybe I need a little more value. Should I deepen the saturation here? What color would work well here? And that's what I love about art as a therapy is that at times when I'm painting, I'm working out life's mysteries. <laughs> and other times when I'm painting, I'm just thinking about color. Ooh, maybe a little touch of turquoise here. <laughs> or I'm thinking about how I'm going to present in class. Or I'm thinking about the attending artists that I'm so blessed by that come in all their different personalities and learning styles and how that is stretching me as a as an instructor but it's also growing me because each week I'm trying to add more value to the class and I I I'm very thankful to have artists to paint with because I learn a lot from them and I'm very thankful to the school that I get to teach at the Green Art House and the staff there, special thanks to Leslie, <laughs> my my partner in crime each week, helping me with just taking in the registrations. And also, if I get a question that's a bit too tricky, <laughs> she can definitely help me answer. So anyways, I just want to thank 
all the folks in my art Fallbrook community. Um, we have really spent some time together and I appreciate all of you, but I also want to thank the online community, each of you for watching these videos and being a part of the discord in the comment section, sharing your thoughts, your comments. It's always um, really cool when my phone notifies me and I get to hear from one of you. So final thoughts. Um, I remove my scotch tape to reveal the cool border. I have my beautiful color trail at the bottom to remind me how to mix my colors should I want to use this winter rose <laughs> palette again. And I like to sign my sketchbook entries with pencil to keep it informal and artsy. Um, please remember if you know somebody that you think would um, like this style or like these techniques, please forward them this video. You can hit, hit the share button and send them the link. You can um, share it on Facebook. And if you do decide to paint along, please remember to use the hashtag art is better shared and tag me at watercolor pour. Anyways, guys, I uh, enjoyed this painting. I hope you did too. And I hope you find that peace and pace in art. Happy painting.